Uh, I used to be at the late lamented Mackey School of Mines at the University of Nevada, and that's where I came up with the first draft of these ideas, which is now a paper, a uh, white paper at Foresight. And uh, I got a chance to turn it into a book. I thought it would take about six months. It took about six years, but at least it's done. So next one, please. So because I probably won't get through all the slides, I have some of the main bullet points first. And we have uh, three key issues that uh, I harp on. One is molecular separation. Uh, that's what blurs the distinction between a resource and a pollutant. You just have a problem where you got a bunch of uh, a mixture and you want to pull something out. If you want it, it's a resource. If you don't want it, it's pollution control. It's the same problem. Uh, also, I harp on non-thermal usage of energy. Two-thirds of your gas tank, as I mentioned before, goes right out the radiator because your internal combustion engine is a Carnot limited device. And the last somewhat longer term uh, issue is the change in materials mix as we get better and better at atomic precision. I should mention that uh, my background is in geology and I have worked in the resource business, so I'm coming at this from a slightly different direction. I know how it's done already. Uh, next one, please. So here's this fundamental technological problem of separation, which I've kind of sketched already. Let's go ahead. Next one, please. And it is not intrinsically an energy-intensive problem. Uh, if you do the thermodynamics, I got a little on that later, uh, we tend to think of it as energy-intensive because of current clumsy technology. Next one, please. Um, which typically involves the partitioning of your uh, desired element into coexisting phases by cooking large amounts of anomalous deposits and waiting for uh, phase separations to cause the partitioning for you. Um, it uh, makes a big mess. <laughs> it requires anomalous feedstocks. And uh, it is not fundamental at all. Its only virtue is uh, it dates to antiquity. Somebody built a fire on a copper-bearing outcrop. And oh, look at these little beads of this funny metal here. Well, that might be useful. So we've been doing more or less the same thing ever since. Next one, please. And uh, this is an example of some of the, uh, the energy usage. This is a so-called molly burn, where you're frying molybdenum disulfide, which is the main ore mineral of molybdenum. And uh, you know, you're, you're wasting a lot of energy. You know, gee, you don't have to do it this way. Next one, please. And doré pour, doré is the raw silver gold alloy as it comes initially out of the smelter. Again, very spectacular, uh, not very efficient. Go ahead. So next one, please. So conventional separation uh, typically involves phase changes. And very typically, these phase changes are driven by heat. And that's where the energy consumption is coming from. Next one, please. Uh, the fundamental cost of element extraction is set by the difference in free energy between the initial and final states, which turns out to be fairly small, usually. If you've got oxides, an oxide ore, like what you get uh, iron from, turns out, uh, you're spending anywhere from 20 to 100 times more energy than you need to. Most ore minerals are sulfides. In theory, thermodynamically, you could react these things with air and get metal as a byproduct, not spend any energy at all. Chemolithotrophic bacteria uh, almost do this, by the way. Next one, please. Next. Biology does things differently. You've got a rather ragged looking uh, tree here. I think it's a limber pine. Improbably perched in some very unpromising substrate, it has pulled CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's pulled nutrients and water out of the soil, managed to self-assemble using only the energy of sunlight. Next one. And so, I'm sorry? OK. So uh, there are lots of other biological examples of low energy separation. I've got another picture of the next one. I like the pictures. There's kidneys are one. There's another one. 
Uh, another one. Whoops. These are diatoms, which are a uh, single-celled uh, alga, actually, and they uh, make their own silica glass by pulling silica in solution out of the surrounding water. Silica is not very soluble in water. This is an impressive feat. Next one. Okay, so to do what biology does, we have to do things molecularly, and that, of course, is where the nanotech comes in. Uh, next one. And uh, there are a number of technological approaches. I won't dwell on these because we've heard about some of them already. But in any case, you have to think about moving mo uh, your solutes or molecules or whatever differentially. Next one. And the solute se selectivity is a major economic driver because oftentimes the one thing you want is either valuable or toxic. <laughs> and so you'd like to say glom onto all the lead and leave the, the uh, calcium behind. Next one. Crown ethers are an example of macrocycles. These ring-shaped molecules, things fit in the ring, you select them. A substituted crown ether, you can replace some of the uh, ring with sulfurs. Next one. And uh, this is being used commercially right now to extract palladium from uh, recycled catalytic converters. This is a very closely held uh, private company in Utah that is doing this. It's, it's going on now, folks. This is, this is not blue sky. Next one. Unfortunately, with these sorts of approaches for binding materials, at some point the substrate fills up and you have to unbind it again. This is called elution. And I call this the elution problem, because if what you're extracting is really fairly common, it's a real nuisance to have to go back and flush everything out again. In fact, it makes your, it makes your uh, uh, separation problem worse. So if we can switch the binding, and under some certain cir circumstances, we bind what we want or don't want, and then we change the conditions and it unbinds again, that would be much nicer. Next one. And uh, there are a number of approaches to doing this, and uh, I've got them listed here. I won't dwell on them. Next one. But basically, uh, you uh, change the electrical potential, or you change the concentration, or whatever, and uh, the material that you've bound becomes free again, and you can take it away. Uh, electrosorption is a very simple example, just electrostatic uh, desalination, essentially. Next one. And uh, this is called uh, <coughs> electrically switched ion exchange, where you're absorbing ions differentially into uh, particular crystal structures. Next. And this is a toy system I worked on where we were looking at using light, exposure to light to cause the switching. I think I have a, a cartoon there. Next one. And I'm focusing on solutions, kind of what uh, Gail talked about, because everything is already mixed up molecularly. And you just can uh, sort out the various uh, materials without any further ado. Um, next one. And you have lots, and this is the Leviathan mine site in extreme eastern California. Next one. Uh, this Technicolor uh, water here is uh, acid mine drainage. It's just full of heavy metals, and it has a pH of about 2. <laughs> Hence all of the uh, berms around it to keep it from flowing into the headwaters of the Carson River. Uh, this is a resource in disguise. Next one. And this is an old anonymous uh, phrase that I've always liked. Um, the other thing I like to emphasize is using heat. It's not just for phase separations, but also in Carnot engines. Fuels are burned. That's what we do with fuels. That's what the word means, right? But that's a very inefficient way of using their chemical energy. Next one. And keep going. I'm going to have to skip through this. And of course, nanotechnology, if we can get to uh, something approaching molecular perfection of bonds, then uh, brittle materials become much more attractive than metals. And uh, next one. And of course, the uh, metals are deeply embedded in culture, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and all that. Uh, next one. 
But uh, of course, all the nanotechnologists know what you really, really want is carbon, if you can make it defect free. Um, here is one carbon source. This is sewage. <laughs> I found it ironic that on the one hand, we dig up reduced carbon compounds from deep in the earth, you know, petroleum and coal. On the other hand, we're taking reduced carbon compounds already at the surface and trying to oxidize them as fast as possible. In fact, uh, the, the oil patch is already, in the petrochemical industry, is already looking at biomass as a substitute for uh, feedstock for petroleum. And there's a lot of carbon on the earth. Um, the big one accessible, let's stop there for a minute. Uh, that's all limestone. This is an outcrop in southern Nevada. This is all calcium carbonate. Um, so this is a resource of the future, and investment opportunities will be discussed after the talk. <laughs> okay. And of course, carbon has a big disadvantage. It burns. The next one. And so let's look at some alternatives. Everybody first thinks of silicon, obviously, like silicon-based life. But in fact, what we should think about is not silicon, but silicates. Next one. So they're based on a, uh, compounds of silicon and oxygen, where actually the uh, oxygen atom is shared between adjacent silicons. You could build very large 3D and polymeric structures, and it doesn't burn. And of course, rocks are silicates. Uh, here's some more, uh, some more uh, potential resources. Uh, the, this is the site of the Burning Man Countercultural Festival, the Black Rock Playa there. Um, nicely comminuted silicates, those will be really, really valuable someday, except, next one, um, the waste from conventional mining is largely comminuted silicates. Next one. And it just sits out there and is a mess. This is a large uh, deposit of comminuted silicate debris from an old copper mine outside Yarrington, Nevada. This would be an ideal feedstock for a, a silicate-based nanotechnology. And so fire and metal, of course, were the building blocks of technology, and they are now the hallmarks of the paleotechnical era, which is what I've taken to calling the present. <laughs> and uh, so we're headed toward a new stone age with uh, metals being replaced by uh, carbon, uh, carbon-based substances and biosilicates. So there's my recap of the key points in case I didn't make it through the talk. And thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to say that for a former professor, it's so nice to see a room full of people who are here because they're interested, so thank you. <laughs> awesome. And the book is here. There's a few copies even available. Um, while we mic up Patrick, uh, is there a question that uh, Steve could address? Yeah. And while we get his presentation ready. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Over there. Top of yeah. Oh, unfortunately, it's an academic publishing house, so it's $99.50 if you buy it off Amazon. I've got some extra copies I will bring in tomorrow. I can sell them for less than that for those who are really interested. <laughs> yeah. Do we get autographs? I, I, and autographs are free. <laughs> um, uh, what technology do you imagine uh, to create uh, n nanoscale structures with silicates? There is, that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> but give, give me the uh, one line version. Um, there are a number of organic reagents that attack silicates. And I'm, in fact, I'm giving a talk on that uh, in June at the Space Resources Roundtable talking about processing lunar regolith. But uh, silicates have the advantage you can create very uh, complicated structures right out of aqueous solution. And uh, Carbon does, doesn't do that. There's a whole, uh, whole kind of uh, subculture, I guess you'd call it, of material science called sol gel processing that's uh, come up in the last probably few decades. And a lot of that is based on silicate, com or, yeah, silicate compounds that you can hydrolyze to silicates. I'm glad that you'll be around and that the book is around. Uh, this was a 
a really nice run through of a lot of things that you know you could be potentially spinning out into project proposals because what we're going to be doing after this session is we're going to have another round of those where you take what you learned from both Stephen and Patrick and try to see whether you want to come up with a new proposal that leverages something that they discussed.